Broadcasting live from the Business Radio X studios in Atlanta, Georgia, it's time for Atlanta Business Radio, brought to you by OnPay, Atlanta's new standard in payroll. Now, here's your host. Lee Cantor here, another episode of Atlanta Business Radio, and this is going to be a good one. But before we get started, it's important to recognize our sponsor, OnPay. Without them, we couldn't be sharing these important stories. Today on Atlanta Business Radio, we have Nick Yeomans. He is the president of Yeomans Consulting Group. Welcome, Nick. Uh, thanks so much for having me, Lee. Glad to be here. I am excited to learn what you're up to. Before we get too far into things, tell us about Yeomans Consulting Group. How are you serving folks? Yeah, yeah. So we have a family business. My dad started it in uh, October 1983. He came into the business to uh, start his career in financial services. And uh, what we do is we help coach and advise people who are pre-retirement to retirement age, making really important decisions. And we have a niche where we also serve family businesses and professional real estate investors. So in context, we help them make decisions around uh, taxation, estate planning, succession planning, and portfolio management, and how you tie it all together. And uh, it's an incredible firm, and I have the best team I've had in over 20 years. It's awesome. Now, what's your backstory? Is this something you always dreamed of when you were younger to get involved in this firm, or was this? <laughs> did you take some turns? Uh, Lee, I think God has a sense of humor. Uh, <laughs> growing up in the family business, uh, you know, I really uh, didn't see myself being a part of this. As a matter of fact, when I was getting ready to go to college, my dad said, son, what do you think you want to do? And I said, no offense, dad, but not this. Anything but this, you know. And he said, that's fine. That's fine. What do you want to do? And I said, you know, dad, uh, I want to be a disc jockey. I want to be on radio. <laughs> and he said, good luck with that, son. And uh, so went away to school for uh, broadcast journalism and fell in love shortly after with public <laughs> relations and advertising and uh, was running uh, marketing campaigns for a financial planner in Chattanooga, Tennessee. And uh, I had as what I can only describe as a God moment where I'm sitting in the office one day and a friend of mine, the owner of that practice, uh, was walking a new uh, widow. She was newly widowed, uh, and they had just met for the first time since her husband had passed. And she looks at my friend, the financial planner, and says, you know, looks at him, and she's crying, and said, I just couldn't do it without you. And she squeezes him, and she looks at me and says, I don't really know what you do, but I know I can't do it without you either. And she leaves. Well, for the first time in my entire life, I have a sleepless night. I go into the office the next morning, and uh, here she comes shortly after me. She had been baking all night. She had brought in a couple of pies, cookies, and all these things and said, I couldn't think of any other way to really say thank you. And I knew immediately what I wanted to do with the rest of my life. So that's, that's my backstory as to how I actually got back into the business. But uh, <laughs> So what, why do you think it, it took that um, moment to kind of have you uh, reset your priorities and, and what you saw, you know, I guess your mission in life now? Uh, you know, um, I'm wired as a helper and a pleaser. I like to help people. It's, uh, you know, that is my ultimate calling is to be a help. And it just so happens that personal finance happens to be an area where so many people need help. They don't, you know, especially in the middle class. I mean, if you are uber, uber, uber wealthy, you probably have somebody like me in your life. Uh, but if you're like that middle class millionaire, the millionaire next door kind of person, first generation have anything, um, you probably don't have somebody like what we do. And so to be able to be a help to those people, uh, that that it just feels so so rewarding and fulfilling for me, you know, to match, you know, your your purpose, you know, the qualitative part of your life and the quantitative part of your life, and have them work together. I mean, for me, there is nothing better than that, um, you know. And to be able to work with my father, I mean, that's just a bonus. I mean, 
uh, to be a part of a family business where we've had different uh, family members over the years be a part of our practice, that also has been really, really rewarding. So, uh, and I think that's probably why we feel uh, so led to helping family businesses today. Now, um, what are what are those people, like you mentioned, these millionaire next door, the people that are just grinding every day and then all of a sudden they look up and they're like, wow, I have a significant amount of money here. What are they doing if they're not working with a financial advisor or um, a wealth management person? Yeah. So, you know, many times, you know, they're so busy in the grind uh, it's hard for them to take, you know, a second and look up, um, you know, there, to to pause and to realize you, you got to stop swinging your axe. It's time to sharpen the axe. Sometimes there's a triggering moment that occurs that, you know, causes somebody to say, you know what, I probably should go talk to somebody or, you know, uh, like some of our clients that have literally started their businesses in their basement. And they look up and now they have a couple of warehouses and now they have, you know, they're, they're employing a hundred people, you know, and they're looking at their payroll and they realize their payroll is, you know, 500 times what their best, you know, income was 15 years ago. You know, it's like they have that aha moment of, um, "Mm, I need to talk to someone. And sometimes it's their tax bill, to be quite honest with you. It's they're they're taking a look at their taxes and they, they have this, kind of all hot, like there's got to be something else I could do to alleviate this pain. I love my uncle, but I don't love him that much. Right. <laughs> so you've got some of those moments. And then finally uh, you have the business owner that he uh, has built something. And it's been really, really wonderful, but you know, he's tired. Maybe, you know, he doesn't know either what his next calling is or the next thing he's going to do but he knows there's got to be something next and he doesn't know how to wind it down, find a successor, position the business for his next chapter, his next phase. And so they're looking for advice around those things. So typically there is a trigger that occurs and then they set out to find somebody perhaps like us. Now, are these people, are they trying to do it themselves? You think, are they just kind of just doing their job working and all of a sudden they, they realized, Hey, I have certain things that are maybe outside of my scope because there are so many kind of do it yourself ways to handle a lot of, you know, what a financial advisor or a um, wealth management person does. Yeah. Well, I think, I think there's two things there. I mean, there's, there's a lot of nuance, but uh, first off, I mean, the people we work with are really smart people. It's not that they can't do that themselves. But is that in line with their passion, their purpose? Are they best suited to try to understand all the tax rules and the estate planning, you know, documents that they need to put in place and and how to best arrange a portfolio? Like, is that the best use of their time? You see, most successful business owners that we work with, they understand the value of time. And most of them choose to delegate to competent people that they bring on because they want a collaborative approach. They want to work with someone who gets them, who understands their mission, understands what their complexities are in life. And like, so if I know you, I really, really know you, then we can tailor and custom, you know, make a plan that is suited towards your needs, but it's also looking out for your best interest. It's trying to help you avoid your dangers, your landmines, looking for your opportunities, your strengths. So I think most people, they reach a level of success where they're looking for that partner that's going to work with them. But, you know, I hate the term, you know, financial advisor and and wealth management and, you know, financial planner and, and, you know, these, there's so many like fiduciaries, the new keyword of the day. The reality is the general public has no, no idea what the difference is between all of these people. And I don't think it's the general public's fault. I think it's our profession's fault. I, I think we've done a really lousy job of educating people, the general consumer, as to what the difference is between all of these different people. I mean, to everyone assumes already that you should be a fiduciary. However, we've got so much legislation today that says you're operating as a fiduciary and you need to disclose that to a client. Well, I don't think a client goes into a financial person's office thinking that they're going to just, you know, 
steal from them and give them really, really bad advice, or else they probably wouldn't go into that office. But now I'm disclosing that I'm a fiduciary in 13 different ways. But what is a fiduciary, right? And what is a financial advisor today from Edward Jones to Merrill Lynch to, you know, the independent registered investment advisory firm? I mean, there's so many different companies and the public has a really, really hard time telling the difference between all these different companies. And there's wonderful people at all these companies doing really, really, you know, solid, valid work. But we as a firm chose to go a different path. We tried to actually create almost like a moniker of more of who we are. And so we call ourselves your retirement coach. You know, we've done a lot of studying and, you know, people generally don't like being told what to do. However, most people can look back to a time in their life where they can look back and see a coach that might have made a difference in their life. You see, a coach comes up with a game plan and a strategy to help you win. And that's what we're doing. We're helping people as your retirement coach retire from the things that you don't want to do that's keeping you from your your purpose, your calling, your mission, helping you eliminate those things, retire from those things so that you've got a clear view and you've got uh, a plan to move forward to really do the things that you love and you care about and that call you cause you fulfillment. So that's why we call ourselves your retirement coach. So now what does a coaching uh, engagement look like? So say I am, uh, which I am, I'm a business owner. I'm towards the, uh, the back nine of my career and um, I haven't done much, but I realize, hey, maybe I should start thinking about these things. I hear you speak. You're very passionate, very intelligent. I say, okay. Nick, let's have a call. Um, Tell me what it would be like working with you. You know, give me the first 30, 90, you know, 365 days of an engagement with your firm. Sure, sure. Um, You know, I know this is going to sound a little weird, but um, we we start with, uh, do you remember the book, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People? Sure. You know, so I love that book. It's an oldie, but a goodie. And I think it should be revisited. We actually do team trainings around that book and, uh, you know, written by the, in the, back in the nineties, but it's so good. Well, one of my favorite habits is the fifth habit. And the fifth habit is seek first to understand then to be understood. So, you know, not to be cheesy, but the reality is we have a consultation together for an hour generally. And I give you a list of things that you can bring in to talk about. Could be employment agreements, buy sell agreements, could be your estate planning document, tax return, et cetera. And we just have a general conversation where I'm trying to really understand Lee. You know, what drives Lee? What keeps Lee up at night? What are the things that really, really, you know, is it maybe a big opportunity for Lee? Or maybe there's something in your tax return where I found a, aha, you know, Lee, if you just change these two things, it might save you $10,000 this coming year. You know, so we kind of had this back and forth dialogue in our first meeting of one, me really trying to understand Lee and then setting out a game plan like Lee, if we were to engage, this is the scope of work. And, you know, we believe that everything affects everything else. So your portfolio, retirement accounts, I mean, beneficiary designations, titling of assets. So from real estate to your bank account, like all of these things matter and they all can potentially impact your taxes, good or bad. They can impact your estate planning. I mean, the reality is nine out of 10 estate plans I review, they'll fail. They will not work the way that clients think they will work. It's, it's you know, the real number is 10 out of 10, but that's hard for people to believe. But I've never met anybody in 20 years that had estate planning documents that they fully understood how they worked. And uh, they, they end up with either, they think they have a springing power of attorney and I review it and find out it's an immediate power of attorney. Well, that's not what they wanted, you know? And you look back, their biggest assets are retirement accounts like 401ks and IRAs. And you look at the beneficiaries and they all say one thing, you know, you've got one tiny line to write out what you want with your biggest asset. And then you look at the will and the trust and it says something completely different. So we really need to understand. So instead of doing a financial plan, I, you know, and I know this is going to sound hypocritical. I'm a certified financial planner that doesn't believe in financial plans. 
Okay. So here's been my experience with financial plans. We put together, you know, 150 pages, really nice paper, leather bound book looks great. I've got all the supporting evidence for all the recommendations. I give it to you. You pay your fee. And here's what happens, Lee. You take it home. It goes on a bookshelf or it goes in a safe and you don't do anything with it. I feel like I did you a disservice. So instead, what we've chosen to do as a firm is put together a financial action checklist. It's basically your personal playbook. And it's two, two to three pages in various financial topics that matter to you. Here's where the customization comes in. So tax planning, estate planning, retirement planning, legacy planning, and charity. Um, it could be debt management, uh, risk management, et cetera. So again, tailor-made to you, business succession, what that looks like. Here's what we understood. Here's what we found. Here's the recommendation. Here's how you implement it. And it's a checklist. And so then, Lee, we have a follow-up meeting that says with you, me, your business partner, uh, your bride, if you're married, and we're sitting down and we say, here's the found findings. Here's the triage. We put it in order of either biggest opportunity or biggest danger. And we have, again, a collaborative meeting that says, hey, here's everything. Now, you might look at it and say, Nick, I understand why you put number one up front, but number three is really the one that keeps me up at night. That's the one that is my biggest pain point. Greatly, no problem. This is your stuff. We move number three to number one. And then if we agree that this is the order of things that we want to tackle, then we walk hand in hand with you. We help you check off all those boxes. And that will generally take anywhere from three to six months to get through it. You know, we'd rather do things right than fast. But, you know, it, it generally gives us enough time and you enough time to both, you know, you've got to live your life and run your business. And at the same time, we've got a lot of homework behind the scenes that we're doing to help you get everything done. So that's a general scope. Once we get everything checked off of that list, then we go into maintenance where we're meeting routinely two to three times a year. So then um, what's happening during those meetings? So once I have the plan in place and it's being executed, obviously life is not static. It's dynamic. Things change all the time. Is this where um, we're reevaluating to make sure the needs that I thought I had six months ago are still my needs for today? Yeah. So good question. Um, Yeah. So one, we're going to have regular meetings on Uh, some topics that just stay on our agenda. So we build an agenda specifically for, in this uh, example, Lee. And so on that agenda, there's going to be some studies on there. So, you know, as an example, if somebody was wanting to exit their business in, let's say, three years, then there's going to be some nuances that we need to understand about either they've already found a buyer, it's going to be an internal transition, you know, whatever it is. So that's the kind of thing that's going to stay on the agenda that we're always talking about. You know, the second thing is going to be at least one meeting a year, we're going to have a tax focused meeting. And here's what we know. Taxes are a matter of fact. Investments are a matter of opinion. Everyone's got a shinier whistle when it comes to investments. However, when it comes to taxes, taxes are taxes. And so we, what we want to make sure that you know, someone like Lee has is a dynamic tax plan that understands what are the rules of today and how does someone like Lee take advantage of those. Then we've got you know, a meeting that's generally more focused on estate planning or the business itself. That is, you know, here's, you know, we started a new 401k. Do we title our beneficiaries correctly? Uh, you know, I've got a new grandchild. Should I set up a 529 plan, et cetera? So we have an, a, a static built agenda that is built towards Lee, but we have a few things that stay on there because we know they're going to be important each and every year. Now, um, Are you replacing my current team of trusted advisors? Do I now get rid of my CPA? Do I get rid of um, my financial advisor? Do I get rid of, you know, the parts of my team might be my uh, attorney? Is this something your firm handles all of this holistically? Or are you helping me navigate all of these people? And if so, are you the quarterback of this new team? Yeah, great 
Great question. You're full of great questions, Lee. <laughs> so, uh, you know, really what we're doing is we're coming alongside you as the coach. You are the quarterback. So you're the hero. We're, we're, we're the guide. Okay. So everything is about you and our focus is a hundred percent on you. And so what we found is most people might have a few pieces of a team that could be a trusted advisor, but many times the folks that we're working with, they might have a really good CPA relationship as an example, but they might not have the other part. So um, an example might be um, maybe you've worked with a, an attorney in the past, but you don't have a, a good relationship with an estate planning attorney. You, Your cousin's uncle's nephew knows somebody at church, right? And they can do your will. Uh, so that's not what we're doing. We're, what we're going to do is we're going to evaluate the relationships you already have in place. We're going to communicate with them and we're going to make sure that everybody's talking together, right? Cause that's really how we wins. When the financial person talks to the tax person and the tax person talks to the legal person, the legal person talks to the insurance person and everybody's talking together with one common thing in place which is what gets Lee the best result. That's what we do. We, we collaborate and bring all those professionals together. Now, we do have a portfolio management arm to our firm. We are set up as a registered investment advisory firm. So for most of our clients, we become their ongoing um, investment manager. Uh, but really what we're doing is we're looking for the holes in your life where you're not getting competent advice and we're helping you fill those holes. And having everybody talk on your behalf. Now, you mentioned that um, family-owned businesses are uh, kind of a niche for you. Um, is that because you have a family-owned business and you kind of understand the pains of that? Or is it just because, you know, that's where a lot of people with a lot of wealth and challenges live? <laughs> yeah, so um, I have a heart for family businesses because I want to see them win. Uh, growing up in one, um, we have had a lot of coaches over the years, and we've been very fortunate to uh, navigate some gaps that a lot of family businesses have struggles with. And so I think my passion within the family business is just this understanding that most family businesses, now depending on what studies you read, you can easily Google this, some say 50% of businesses fail going to the second generation. Other statistics say 70% of businesses fail going to second generation. That's huge. And it doesn't have to be that way. It doesn't have to be that way. Um, you know, and then there's other statistics. Again, the almighty Google at your fingertips, you can look this up. Over 90% of businesses fail going to third generation. That is unbelievable, unbelievable. And I think there's two huge things that people can do as business owners, especially if you're the head of the business that you could do to help set up your family for success, especially in the context of your business. Number one, having a communication policy with the next gen. That's huge. That is so, so underrated and yet so important. Number two is setting the right expectations. You know, that is one thing my father did extremely effectively. When I first came to work, when, you know, after I have that experience with the financial planner in Chattanooga, I said, you know, call up dad and I say, hey, I think I want to do this for the rest of my life. So he was going to a conference in Scottsdale, Arizona. He says, why don't you come with me and we'll talk. So he and I are talking and he said, look, in order for this to work, you and I have to be on the same page. He and I are both very type A, very driven people. And, uh, but he was my wrestling coach when I was younger and I had to look at him like my wrestling coach, like my coach, my coach is looking out for me and he is trying to coach me to win the match. Okay. So if he, if he's got my best interest in mind, I've got to submit and listen to the coach. So that's what I was able to do. I, I was able to have that mindset, but he said this, and this was powerful. He said, I'm going to pay you what you're worth. And you're not worth a whole lot right now. <laughs> Great expectation, right? Yeah. And I said, 
you know, I'm like, probably not what you wanted to hear. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I didn't even know what that meant. And he said, you know, I'm going to pay you just above poverty. Okay. And he gave me a list of things he wanted me to do. He gave me a checklist of books he wanted me to read. He gave me a list of certifications he wanted me to achieve, licensing he wanted me to get, et cetera. He gave me like, I don't remember if the list was 30 things or 50 things, but I had to check off each thing. He said, when you complete this, you'll be of value. You'll, you'll add value and we can readdress your compensation. So I show up my first week of work. And he hands me a business card. Now, you got to think, I'm a young guy at the time. I'm excited. Man, it's a big deal. I'm getting a business card, right? Like, this is a big deal, big moment. I look at the card, and it says CFM, Chief Fecal Monitor. I was in charge of the bathrooms. (laughs) So, you know, Randy, my dad, you know, he set expectations early on. But then we communicated about the policy of my future at the firm. And that's where a lot of family businesses kind of miss it. They don't set the expectations up front and they don't have, they don't communicate about what the future is for that young professional that might be coming into the business. Yeah. I've had the privilege of hosting a show about or co-hosting a show about family businesses. And I was totally unaware of it. I don't have a family business and I didn't ever work in one. And the, when we were interviewing the different family um, business leaders, it was just so fascinating to me. At first, I wasn't aware of just how many there are out there. There's so many of them out there and so many firms that you've heard of are family businesses. But also just the, the day-to-day challenges to separate you know, their life as a family and their life as business people and what do you do with the kid that doesn't want to be part of the business, but then something happens and then all of a sudden there's a lot of money and they're like, well, I want to be part of the business now. You know, like there's so much challenges that just a regular business that isn't family run doesn't have to deal with, you know, even in terms of growing your talent within your organization, you know, if a person who's a great uh, employee there isn't a family member and sees a family member come in, you know, then it starts, how do you manage that person's ego? And, you know, knowing that they may never get that, you know, big seat at the table because of who they are. There's just so many challenges and to have somebody that's kind of living it, I would think is such a gift and advantage for you to help your clients. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we, um, Gosh, there's so much to unpack there. Um, one, it is you know, it is so much better to I think uh, receive uh, advice and instruction and counsel, wise counsel from somebody who's been in the trenches, than somebody who knows you know they've read about it and they have some philosophy, but they've never actually done it. I think you could just speak to it differently when you've been in those trenches. Um, and I think the second part there is, you know, when you are evaluating your talent, um, you know, so I've got a brother and sister as an example. Okay. And my brother and sister, they, they chose different paths. They both had an opportunity to come into the business and both chose differently. Um, which is cool. We have a great, great relationship. But there are a few boundaries that we had to set up in place. So hopefully this is helpful to some listener out there. But, you know, when I'm in the office for the purposes of what our clients hear, what our team hears, I don't call my dad, dad in the office. It's Randy in the office. However, when I leave the office, you know, and I you know, check out on the clock there, it goes to dad again. It's dad. And early on, I had a challenge with that. The first couple of years working here where my siblings very quickly reminded me, it's not Randy, it's dad. Right. So, you know, we've set the boundaries that, you know, it's business talk, you know, eight to six, 7 PM. But after that, you know, we try to shut down the business talk. And when we're at family functions, like family dinners and birthdays, you know, we had, we set some rules. We don't talk business. We, you know, we want that, that family life to still exist. And sometimes if we have stress going on in the business, and it could be because, 
he and I, you know, we're both owners. We could want two different directions in the business. Well, I don't want to bring that stress into a family birthday, and neither does he. He and I have a common mission that, you know, the stress needs to stay with the business, not with the personal. And so, again, setting those boundaries and those expectations. Um, and I think communicating to also your team and that person who's coming into the business, here is your career path, you know, so that when you do have that person that says, you know, am I ever really going to be in a position to be an owner? You know, he's got his son, he's got his daughter in the business. Will I ever be able to be as, uh, have the same career path and same opportunity? Well, I think you got to set that expectation with the whole team. Here's my expectation for Nick. Here's my expectation for Jane, you know, Smith over here. Here's, here's our expectations. Here's our career path. Here's what your opportunities are in the companies. And so many times where I see some business owners fail, they don't set those roadmaps very clearly for the family member coming into the business. So the family member comes in and they either think one of two things, you know, one, they're going to hand over the keys and I'm going to be the top dog now, or they think they're going to get maybe some special privileges or nuances, right? And then if the team starts seeing that, that could really weaken the team. So you do have to be really, really careful, and communication is super important. Yeah, and I think that that's um, kind of a competitive advantage I would think you have is that you kind of lived this and you're lear- you've learned it from by doing, not by, you know, like you said, reading a book about it. Um, or, you know, reading six case studies when you were in college. So, I mean, I, I think that you're the, you're, what you're sharing with your clients is just super helpful and it's set you apart from other firms doing uh, what might look like a similar thing. Yeah. Now, yeah. If, if somebody wants to connect with you and learn more um, and, um, you know, get some coaching from the retirement coach, uh, where should they go? Yeah, uh, great question. So you can find us at www.yourretirementcoach.com. Um, and we are working on uh, releasing in the new year of 2024 a uh, podcast that will be called Coffee with Your Retirement Coach. And that's where Randy, a.k.a. Dad, and I are going to be sharing different nuggets of wisdom, keeping it short, 25 to 35 minutes. Uh, on various topics that might matter to you individually or as a family business. Uh, but that will be released on all the major uh, podcast carriers. So those will be two places you might be able to find us. Good stuff. Well, Nick, thank you so much for sharing your story today. You're doing such important work, and we appreciate you. Yeah, Lee, thanks so much for having me. It's been fun. All right, this is Lee Cantor. We'll see you next time on Atlanta Business Radio.